This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you for your time and I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you today. I didn't know exactly what was expected of me so I kind of put together a hodgepodge of things to give you some feeling of who I am as a person. I think that's really important because it impacts everything you do in your life. Uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my research and the company I work for because I think it's just super exciting. And, and then I thought I'd give you a, little, a few pointers of sort of lessons learned. Uh, I've only done this for a very short amount of time the entrepreneurial part um, but I'll tell you about the lessons learned they're very fresh um, and then uh, I will talk to you about some uh, I guess sort of advice or about work-life balance so again my name is Chandra I'm in the computer science department and uh, I start with just kind of an outline of where I came from and I think this is important because my point is here you can come from all kinds of different paths and different backgrounds and it doesn't have to be perfect you don't have to have chosen all the right uh, made all the right choices along the way and you can still be successful in very interesting ways I grew up in the Midwest uh, in a very rural part of the world uh, on a farm in Indiana I um, have amazing parents and uh, we were really focused on making sure everyone was going to college and I did just that. I was on the straight and narrow until I met a really cool uh, woman from LA who was my roommate in my college dorm. Uh, we went to college together, had a great couple two years and after two years she decided she was just going to quit and go home to back to LA to her family and just kind of live the LA life and she said why don't you come with? And I'm in the middle, I was a very good student, I was kind of, you know, again, just did everything right and exactly what my parents wanted and she approaches me with this. And by the way, all the stars are life-changing moments. This is one of the life-changing moments where she said, let's go, let's, let's quit what we're doing, let's drop out and let's move to LA. You can live with my parents, it'll be free and then we'll find work there. And I did. And I freaked out my parents. To this day, they, they, they you know, uh, uh, want to sue me for the heart attacks that they had and all that, the, the health insurance that that cost us. But once I got over that, um, this was a huge adventure for me. And I didn't go to school. This was the early 90s. Computers were just coming into their own. Uh, so there were jobs everywhere. And so you didn't need uh, uh, even an undergraduate education to make pretty good money. So I was moving through the ranks, making good money, but just really loving the LA scene and taking advantage of that full city. But then I started to get a little bored. And I thought, well, and, I, and I, I really was money focused. I really wanted to make a lot of money and just, you know, have a very rich life. And, uh, and as I was doing that, uh, and working towards it, I kept hitting, uh, hitting a ceiling. I didn't have an undergraduate degree, so therefore they weren't going to promote me enough to I could, where I could get to the next level. So uh, I, uh, I, I decided, okay, well, I'm just going to go back to a, a commuter school and finish my degree so I can just get to that next paycheck, right? So I go back, I go to commuter school in Los Angeles uh, to finish my degree. I'm working, um, and I meet this amazing professor. Again, star, changed my life. 
this guy st sits me down and says, you know, you're really good at this stuff. Um, you should think about more than just the paycheck at the end of the day. You should think about what computer science gives you in terms of the ability to do all kinds of cool and creative things, to actually impact the lives of others. And I really wasn't thinking at all along those lines. And he's like, I think, you, I think you'd be really good. You should at least consider other job options, like going to grad school and maybe becoming a professor yourself. And I'm a professor, Jesus, no, old people and boring and ooh. And, but he was an amazing guy and he had a great you know, life and he was doing all kinds of cool stuff. And, and I said, okay, well maybe I'll try it. I was kind of bored with what I was doing. And so, um, and he also at that time introduced me to my future husband. So this man had a humongous impact on my life and I didn't even know it then. So I went to grad school after that at UC San Diego, as John said, and, um, and I, just life changing. I, I went doing it to go just to do a master's because I thought, okay, master's is great make good money for that. Um, and uh, there's no way I'm doing a PhD. No way. It is frightening. It's big. It's ugly. I'm not going to sit, st you know, be in one place for five years. Oh my God. Um, and then I arrived and I saw all the things that re what, about what research was. And in computer science, in an engineering field, it's really about innovation. It's about finding solutions to problems that no one else can solve. It's detective work. It's, it's extremely exciting. And you're on the cutting edge all the time. You have to be, because industry's out there doing it way faster than you. So you have to be very clever. And I really love that sort of, sort of intellectual challenge. And there's just some great people that I was working with. So um, I did actually just kind of fell into the PhD. And five years later, I woke up and I had a PhD. And I was just like, wow, OK, that wasn't, wasn't so bad. Uh, I, I, I suffered through. And, and I thought, well, I'm never going to get a position because there's no positions in academia. They're really hard to come by. And, and by now, I um, you know, was pretty much sure I was going to marry this guy who was also a professor. So now look at that. Um, we go out for jobs. There's no jobs in the United States. And we want two of them in the same department. Impossible, right? Not possible. But what had happened was um, there was that huge bubble in, uh, in, in internet technology at the time. And everybody who was in systems in computer science was leaving academia to go and do startup companies, right? Right before the bubble burst, right? So that happened here. A handful of people who I actually just they wanted to come here to work with, um, had, had gone out on their own to try their hand in these startup companies. And so there were available slots only in computer science systems. So the stars aligned. We got jobs here. Um, and you know, had gr a bunch of great colleagues. So it was really, really exciting. I uh, got married. That is kind of a life-changing thing. So I put a star there. Uh, uh, and I started developing a lab. Um, you know, the PhD is hard work. It's, it's really, you know, good focus time, though. Um, being a professor, you have to do that, like, tenfold. And you're constantly distracted because you've got to have a, build a research group, you've got to get money, you've got to support and mentor your students, and all this is great, but it really is hard as you're working towards this, this big milestone that you all want to achieve if you're an academic, and that's tenure. It's usually a f five to six year effort where you know you just suffer through and, and, and make a name for yourself really in a very short amount of time. And if they give you the thumbs up, you got a job for life. If they don't, I can go and make three times the money in Silicon Valley. <laughs> So it really wasn't so bad of an option. Um, and I made it, and I was really happy. And, um, and that gave me the freedom. What tenure gives you as a professor is the freedom to work on really, really hard problems. Problems that no one else can take on in industry because they are looking at the bottom line, because they have a time horizon that is so much shorter than what I have. I have the rest of my life. So I started to stretch my wings and start to get out of my comfort zone a little and said, OK, what do I want to work on? I want to I want to solve really hard problems. I want to change the world. I really do want to make a difference. And what I'm passionate about is enabling average people, not computer scientists, to be able to solve problems with computers, right? So what does that mean? That means it has to be really, really simple for you to think about problem solving, for you to communicate what you want a computer to do and get it to do what you want and get a cool answer to actually f do something that's, that's new and different and innovative. Right? I want to broaden that participation. And, and so in doing that, what you have to do is you have to make it really easy to communicate the questions you want to ask the computer to solve for you. Let's say you're, you're studying really interesting problems in science, or, or in, uh, you're, you're trying to 
uh, find genes that um, uh, cause ha have are, are linked to cancer. Um, all of this has to do with data, and you want to ask questions about that data. It should be very easy for you to ask questions about that data. You shouldn't even know you're asking questions of a computer, right? I want it to be that easy. Okay, what that means then, from my perspective, is that I have to build all the software infrastructure below that to make it happen, right? I make it so easy, that means all of the effort has to go into what is called the runtime system, the system that runs your programs, that runs, that, in, 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 uh, that implements your questions, okay? So that's what I wanted to do, and I wanted to do it and, you know, make sure that we could you know, actually solve some real problems as well along the way. So uh, that really was the genesis for this project that I work on now, which is AppScale. AppScale is um, an, a cloud platform. How many people know what cloud computing is? Very good. It's a cloud platform that makes it really, really easy for developers, still developers, you've got to program a little still, to uh, develop applications that do interesting things, okay? So it is the ideal of what I wanted to work on. At the same time, we thought, well, I want to do that. I said, I want to do this in open source. I've never had an open source experience. I've contributed to open source projects. And, um, but it's really, it would be cool to have a project that other people contributed to and actually gave me their feedback immediately. Um, so we try, my group and I tried that, and that worked out really well. And three and a half, four years later, we wake up and we look around and we have lots and lots of users that are from all over the world that are using our stuff. And my students were graduating and really in academia, students do most of the work. So they're leaving and, they, and we have all this uptake and we have all this, this potential. And I would, still I would still work on it, I could do it with other students, but they said to me, why don't we try to do a startup company on this? We've got uptake, we see the potential, we're the only thing out there that's like this. Let's try it. Another life-changing moment. I say, absolutely not. I'm going to go back to my office. I'm going to mentor my students, which I love, and I'm going to find new projects. And the reason why I said that is because of what John said earlier. I had a husband at the time who was an entrepreneur who had done his own startup company, a startup company in cloud computing of all things, and it was just ridiculous. You know, I had taken on the, all of the household duties, and I had promised that I would take care of everything so that he could go and do that. Because hey, I'd have my day, but that was the agreement. So I didn't even consider it. I said, absolutely not, this is not for me. I'm gonna do what I do, I love what I do, because I really do, um, and I'm just gonna stay here and do this. But my husband had been doing it for about four years, and he said, you know, uh, completely independently, I'm thinking about going back to the university. And that, at that moment, that's what the star's from that I actually considered, allowed myself to consider what it would be like if I actually tried this for myself. And it was huge, it was very exciting, and it turned out to be what I really wanted to do. And so my students and I joined forces and uh, found a great you know, business expert, and now we are a small little tiny company, but we have really cool internships and a great location downtown. So before I give you sort of you know, my experience of this in this path, I thought I'd try to tell you what it is that we're trying to do and why it makes sense as a business, okay? All right, <laughs> cloud computing, you, a lot of you raised your hands, but there's some, there's some f you know, sort of fine, sort of, sort of subtleties in cloud computing because it's actually a very broad, overloaded term and I start to, thought I'd start to break it down for you a little bit. First of all, if you think of, when I say cloud computing, right now I'm talking about public cloud computing. The idea is there are companies that have super huge data centers. Think Google, think Facebook, think Microsoft, think IBM. Huge, huge um, warehouse size clusters of computers that they use for them, their own use, right? Um, so those, those exist. And what they found, Amazon, for example, huge amount numbers of machines. And what they found was that, th sure, during the, let's say Amazon.com. Amazon.com's cluster infrastructure is really heavily used during the holidays, when we're all at the last minute trying to get all of our presents shipped to the people that we, we love and that we forgot about until the very last minute. <laughs> we need that extra capacity to, to handle all of us doing that at that moment. However, you know, mid-May, you know, we're not even out of school yet here. You know, there's not a lot of activity. 
you know, that data center, all those machines, a lot of them are just sitting there idle, right? You could turn them off. But Amazon said, well, why don't I just make them accessible to average users who just want to use them as real computers, servers? I'm going to own them, but I'm going to virtualize them and give all the world access to them. Entire servers. They're virtual, but they're, they're still real servers. They're just entire machines that execute on a physical machine. And that's nice because it isolates you from everybody else, right? We have this protective layer, and you can have as many as you want, as many as your credit card will pay for. And they're very cheap. So much cheaper than if you would own those physical machines and maintain them yourself, right? It's actually cheaper. And you can think of it as infinite, infinite scale, infinite number of computers because there's so many, you'll easily wipe out your credit card before you're able to allocate all of those machines, right? And during the holidays, then you make a request and Amazon says, no, sorry, I'm using the machines, right? Doesn't usually happen, They're, they've now expanded this so much that there's always plenty of machines for you. All right, so this idea that couples e-commerce, electronic commerce, us paying for stuff over the web, is coupled with this idea that what we're paying for is, is, is machines, is ser our servers, the disk for our storage, for our music, um, you know, compute power if we want to solve some interesting problems, um, you know, large, uh, uh, large amounts of you know, memory uh, so you can you know, work on big, big, huge problems if you want. All right, so and you pay for this through web services. It's, a, it's an e-commerce model for machines. That's really the difference, right? E-commerce was there before. Machines were there before. Remote access to machines was there before. This isn't rocket science. It all just kind of came together, and the opportunity was there, and Amazon made it a po possibility. This is called infrastructure as a service. Amazon has an infrastructure, a bunch of computers. It's going to rent you them on a very low am amount on a pay-per-use basis, right? All right, now think about this. How many of you um, have ever logged into a machine somewhere on campus, somewhere else? So not using your laptop, okay, good. So you're familiar with that. That, uh, that ability to log into a machine um, is what you get with Amazon. However, that machine that you log into has nothing on it. It's sitting there waiting for you to do whatever you want with it. But think about this. If you need to use a database, you got to go and install a database. If you're not a computer scientist, this is even if you are a computer scientist, this is no, no easy feat today. If you want to um, have a website that is load balanced, you know, you're going to have to become a computer scientist to be able to figure out what that is, even what those words mean, and implement it in your servers that you asked for. Right? You are you have full control. At the same time, you have full control. You are in charge, right? Not so easy for the common man. This is how it looks. Uh, he, here's a bunch of servers. There's actual physical hardware, storage, disks, servers, computers. Um, that's managed by some vendor. Everything else that you want, if you want some database, you want some file storage, you want some security, you want some logins, that's all up to you. All this is managed by you, and you do it over the web, right? All right, next, next up though, sorry, going the wrong way. There you go. So the next step, the natural progression of things in computer science is to simplify, right? So the hard part of that is that you have full control and you have to go in and you stitch everything together and install all these things. We need to make that easier. Why don't we set it up so that instead of giving you physical servers and making you do all the work, why don't we just give you physical servers and do all the work for you? This is called platform as a service. Platform as a service says you just write your code, your innovation. You write a cool Python app, you write a cool Java app, you write some .NET code. You should be able to make that into a web service anybody can get to in minutes. That's how easy it should be. You, you hand it over to one of these systems, these platforms as a service, and your program just runs. And if by chance it goes viral and millions of people come to your site, the, the, the vendor actually handles that all for you, completely transparently. And then when it's all boring and nobody goes to your site, it shuts everything down so you don't have to pay for it. It is so easy. It is the next step to easy. Right? Okay, so that's what platform as a service is. 
There's also, and, and by the way, so, so, and what's so cool about this is that the infrastructure as a service people, Amazons and rack spaces of the world, they are seeing the light and saying, oh, you're right, we need to do, give you a little bit more, uh, make it a little bit easier for, for our users. So they're starting to put in platforms as a service on top of their stuff, okay? So they're moving towards the platform. The guys like Google App Engine and Microsoft Azure, who are platforms as a service, see also the need to allocate servers, because that makes sense for some people. So they're moving down, and they're saying, all right, we're going to provide servers as well. So everybody's getting the same thing. Bunch of servers, bunch of ways of accessing those servers. And then there's this thing you probably have heard of called software as a service. And the idea here is the vendor manages everything. You don't write a piece of code. They write the code, they deploy it, they scale it, they manage it, they get all the security right. And you just go to the application over a web, over using a browser or using your phone, and you customize it for yourself. So you have an instance that's customized for you, I have an instance that's customized for me. We keep each other separate, We're, we don't interfere with each other, and that is software as a service. And that's really appealing because you're, uh, the, if you're a software as a service startup, it's really nice because you have to write one application. You gotta make it customizable, you gotta make it scale, but nobody is coming in and, and messing with your machines. You have full control. You just expose it through the web. Okay, so you see the different benefits of all the different models. Um, all of them work, all of them are making money. Uh, there's great features here. I kind of mentioned them already. The ease of use, it automatically grows and shrinks with the use of your apps. All this is taken care of for you. Security's taken care of for you. Um, all this great stuff, as long as you run on somebody else's machines. As long as you run on Amazon, as long as you run on Google, as long as you run on IBM. And they're just slowly taking your money. It is a little bit of money, it is true. But you start building a business on this and soon you'll see you're gonna be spending quite a bit. All right, so wouldn't it be nice if we could get all that nice, cool systems-y stuff and run it on the machines that we already have. Because most companies have a bunch of machines sitting around. The university here, we have tons of machines. Wouldn't it be cool if we could take all that public, you know, proprietary software and run it on the machines we have here? You as a student, you have a, um, you know, some sort of term paper due. You, you need a machine to, to be able to turn it in or get access to it. All you do is you go to the website and you say, give me a machine. You have a project due where you have to do some data analytics. Um, you need to, you know, and if you're in computer science, write some code. You need a machine to run it on. You go to a website and say, hey, give me a machine. You have all of this at your disposal. Nice dream, but it actually exists. We want to take those public cloud technologies, all those cool features, and we want to bring them locally. Why? Because they're cool features, and I don't want to have to pay all the time to somebody else. But there's other reasons. The big reason is this is my code and my data. What happens if it's patient data? What happens if it's military data? What happens if it's just data? What happens if it's your pictures, right? Um, sure, you may not care, but someday you might. Someday the government might go to one of these companies and say, hey, turn over everything you got on this person. And they have to do it. You don't have control over your data. You don't have control over who uses your data. These companies are in, the are in the data business. Advertising is about data. They figure out what you do and what you like and where you live and you know who you're walking home with and they target you for advertising. It helps you in many cases. It's kind of annoying in others. Right? These companies are, are um, incentivized by trying to get you to use their systems so they can collect information on us. Okay, that's not so comfortable for many companies, many situations. It's great for some, but it's not so good for others. So there's this idea of um, also of lock-in. If you go and you start to use Amazon or you go and you start to use Google or Microsoft Azure, it has a set of APIs, this, this way of accessing, this way of talking on the webs to, talking on the web to access those, those resources. You say you want a computer in Amazon, that's a little bit different than if you say you want a computer in Microsoft Azure. Okay? It's a little bit different also than if you said, hey Google, I want a computer. 
right? So that's called the API. That's the interface to which you use to access those resources. That's a little bit different. So once you choose one and you use it all the time and you become familiar with it or you write programs against it, you're stuck if you want to move all your stuff to another cloud. They make it, they lock you in on purpose because they don't want it to be too easy for you to move clouds. Okay, so that's what's called lock-in. People are afraid of lock-in. They're afraid of have privacy of their data. They're afraid of lock-in. They just would like to be able to use the computer resources that they have around them, period. Um, also, from a computer science perspective, uh, I like to develop locally. I don't want to develop and then debug and figure out what my problems are in my program you, while I'm paying for it. It'd be cool to work them all out first. We all do this. We play around on our laptop first before we actually do something serious with, with real machines. So there's no way to do that. It's very difficult to do that in the public setting. Why? Because they want you to use a public setting. They want you to pay. They want to get your data. All right, and God forbid things go down. Now they give you your money back if things go down. But if they give you your money back and you lose business in your, in your startup, Right? Your, your website goes viral and you're getting all this business as you're just starting out and Google goes down or Microsoft goes down, they say, oh, I'm sorry, here's your money back. Not all the money you lost for those customers, but the 15 cents you were paying to use those machines. Right? It's, it's not in your control. You have no idea even when scheduled maintenance, maintenance is going to happen. All right, so um, what we do, what my project is then, is to try to bring a public cloud system to the masses. Okay, that's the goal, and I'm going to do it at the platform level. You know, I, I, there's the you know the eucalyptus people do it at the at the infrastructure level, that Amazon equivalent. I want to do it at the runtime level because that's just my passion. I love that stuff, and I think that's how we're going to enable the masses to develop and ask questions about uh, data and with computers. So I'm going to work at the, the, the application level. And I looked around, this is four years ago, and I said, well, what system is out there that's decent? And there, a Azure wasn't even launched yet, Microsoft Azure, Microsoft's cloud platform, um, but Google was. And there was a lot of uptake, and a lot of people were trying it out and, and figuring it out. And, um, and we said, OK, well, let's just try Google. Google is arguably one of the world's leading experts in web services. Think all those cool Office products that are for free via Google Drive. Think about Google Earth. Think about Gmail, right? Those are all software web services. That's all they do. Google's developers develop web services. And now, more and more mobile apps. If you think about the apps on your phone, there's a piece that runs on your phone, but there's also a piece that runs elsewhere. You don't need to know where that elsewhere is. If you want to communicate with your friends, you want to communicate information, you want to store things, your phone can't take it. It's going to execute somewhere else. That somewhere else is a cloud, right? So the future really is are these web services and these mobile app, I call them the mobile app backends. The apps are cool, great, but the real cool technology is what sits behind them to allow sharing and collaboration and, um, and game playing across multiple users, all that cool stuff. So we picked Google App Engine. Google App Engine took all this great experience for developing web and mobile apps, and they said, and they said they were looking at their own developers, and they said, okay, what do you do best? What do you, what makes you most productive? How could we make your life easier so you could innovate better? And what they found was there's a bunch of things that apps need: security, authentication, logins. I mean, how many times do you log into something in a day? Right? Many times. Everybody who wrote those apps that you're using had to write that authentication piece. Now, how silly is that? Right? Why should we all write the exact same thing? Google says, don't. We'll do it in the platform. If you want to access to it, you just say, hey, I need a little authentication here. And you put it on your web page, and it just works. Everybody uses databases. Right? Everybody, all apps have to store data somewhere. That storage is repeated for every app developer. And the app developers at Google said, this is ridiculous. I, don't, I even have to set up this silly d database in order to get my app to run. Google says, OK, we'll take care of that for you. And they did this for a bunch of services that all apps need and that all mobile app backends need. Okay? And they put it in a platform. And that platform is called Google App Engine. I call it the secret sauce. 
the secret sauce because it is addictive. It is so easy to use and it's so great to uh, innovate so fast that it moves towards the vision that I have, which is let's get everybody using this stuff to solve more and more interesting problems, okay? So it's an ideal, it's exactly what we want, right? It makes everybody more efficient. It makes super experts more efficient. So it doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum, you can participate and you can do things and, and do innovations quicker. Okay, so it's called App Engine. The problem is you're stuck with Google. The only place your apps will run, if you use this secret sauce, is on Google's resources. Oh, by the way, so Google studied all of its devs, figured all this out, and put it all in the platform. And it was just going to give the platform to its own devs. And they said, no, let's give it to everyone. We can see what everyone does. We can get more people to use our equipment. We can gather more data. And we can make it available at really, really low cost, make a little money. But it's the data collection that was really uh, utmost importance. OK, so they make it available as this thing called App Engine. Um, it only, if you write to this, if you write programs for this, you can only run on Google's machines, on Google's clusters. There's a lot of them, and they're very cheap. I could run for hours and pay 25 cents. It's a lot cheaper than if you bought a computer and worked uh, by your side. But if you're a real company, um, after a while, the costs do add up especially if you go viral. There's no way to cap the usage or the, the charge to your credit card unless you have sort of, you know, something on the credit card itself. If it goes viral, Google will take care of it. It'll handle all that, all that scale, and then it'll charge you for it. So we thought, well, what happens if we took Google App Engine and implemented it in open source and gave it away? That's what App Scale is. It is Google App Engine in open source. So any app, there's a million of them today, one million apps executing right now on Google App Engine. If we do this right, we can get all one million to execute over App Scale without any modification. So what this does is it gives you the ability not to just execute on Google's resources, but to execute everywhere. And I mean everywhere, on your laptop, on your cluster at school, on your, uh, your if you're wanting to, you want to go execute in Amazon, you can run all of Google in Amazon. I mean, it sounds a little ridiculous, but you can. Um, execute everywhere, right? The, the portability is what I was going for here. And then we have to now have a business out of this. And it was great when we were giving it away. We built it. It exists. It runs all those apps, right? You have the portability. It's free. You can download it now. Um, the problem is we have to make a business out of this. So we, my students were graduating with their PhDs. They were defend, getting ready to defend. This is last December. We started in October. My, myself and, the, and, and my CEO waiting for our, my, my two guys to finish and graduate. And uh, we just spent all that time, the last eight months, just going and talking to customers. And this is part of my lessons learned, but it's such a cool thing. You learn so much. You go in thinking, oh, I have the answer. I have the Swiss Army knife of cloud. And they're like, I'm not paying for that. It's free. I'm just going to use it. And it's great. Thank you. And you can go now. And it took us a long time to be banging our heads against these customers saying, well, well, what would you pay for? And after a while, we found we're not even telling them about AppScale. We're not giving them this feel. We're just going to walk in and we're going to say, you have developers, right? You make mobile apps? And the answer is always yes. You make web apps? Yes, yes, yes. And we said, what is the biggest pain you have? What is the thing you hate the most? What makes your developers super inefficient? Or hey, developers, what just irritates the crap out of you? And they tell you. And after a while, you start hearing the same things. And what we found was that what everybody wanted was a way to automatically fail over from Google. Google goes down. They're scared to death that they can't control it. They can't control their app. And their app is done. And their app can't execute anywhere else. They would love it. They would pay me if I could make a product that allowed their app to automatically fail over to somewhere else. They don't even care where. Now they'll even pay for it. They'll pay for the actual f f failover. Um, and they'll pay for this product. And it took eight months of talking to over 200 people before this became clear. And I had no idea this was coming. We had mentioned this. We call it disaster recovery back then. We did a little prototype, make sure we could do it. Um, I had no idea this was, and that's what everybody wanted. 
And so what our business model is then, and of course we just discover this on the fly, we're not geniuses, I know nothing about business. Um, uh, we want to give our, our software away, so what we're going to do then is what, what's called an open core model, where you plug in proprietary licensed software. You can have AppScale for free, go build a failover, it, it will, you can do it, right? Uh, my team is better, you might as well just pay me for it, it'll be cheaper because the number of developers you're going to need to learn a system of, you know, some 100, you know, 100, uh, sorry, over a million lines, just, just pay me for it, and I will make it happen for you. So it's free. You can do it yourself. We will give you it. We will sell you uh, automatic failover if you want it. So this is for all app engine app developers, right? So if you think about this, people, only people who use app engine are going to want failover. So another thing I learned, being an entrepreneur, is start like this. Go and find the pain point and get something that somebody will pay for today. But have a vision of where you're going later, right? So sure, I can, I can go to all these App Engine developers. There's 250,000 of them today. I can ask them to buy failover for each of their apps, and I can get started. I know they will pay. I can get off the ground. But the bigger picture is this larger vision. This larger vision, how am I going to get other people to buy into this model? Well, we, what we did is we, we just went and asked Google. <laughs> we said, hey, Google, will you see me, please? And it took me like 15 mails and you know, crying and knocking on people's doors. Finally, they let us in and they talked to us. And they said, you know, the biggest complaint we get when we go out to, our, our, to, to people and say, hey, come use App Engine, they're like, no, 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 we'll get locked in. You know, I, you're the only game in town. And they said, so why don't we partner and you, and when, they, when we hit this, when we hear this, we can say, no, 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 but there's AppScale. AppScale is free. It is available. You can buy support for it. You can buy training. It's available for you. You have someone to call when things go bad. You can have automatic failover. And Google wins. Why? Because Google believes that ultimately they're amazing. <laughs> Google App Engine is the be all end all. Eventually you'll go. They'll be, they believe that. And that's okay because I can still get off the ground. And even if everybody goes to Google App Engine eventually, they'll still want a failover. They'll still want a way to get off in case they start paying too much or they want to, or something new comes along. And so that was really a lesson for me. Um, one, start focused. Two, have a bigger vision of how you're going to get more people. Um, and then our larger focus beyond that, we even, I have it man, you know, totally mapped out um, because I'm really nervous about how that all works, uh, is uh, m mobile apps. I really think people need to develop mobile apps. You all need to develop mobile apps. You're going to have the mobile app part on your phone. You're going to do something really creative with the back end. You need to do it. All of you need to be able to do it really quickly, regardless of whether you've ever taken a class from me. Right? And I do believe that's the future. There's so many devices out there. You can have such impact. You can do such cool things. Um, Google Glasses, it's just like a mobile phone, right? It uses App Engine for the back end, right? There is a lot going on here, and it's really, really exciting. So that's pretty much it from the AppScale perspective. Um, any questions just on the AppScale system or our thinking on that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Google itself can't ship software, so they'll never be able to solve the pain point that we're solving, which is portability. So Google's on board. The other guys, they, oh yeah, oh yeah, they, yes, that, we're a Google Cloud Technology Partner, which was crazy that that happened, and I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, and then they, they want to, you know, go out and talk to customers together. They really think that this is going to get more people in the App Engine model. That's all they care about. Get them in the App Engine model, they'll eventually try App Engine. And you might. This way you get a control. You get a little bit of both. Or none of, none, none of app scale, but it's there if you want it. It's an insurance policy. Or a ton of it, whatever works for you. Right? They believe that you'll eventually go to App Engine because it's just so scalable. I mean, infinite number of computers. Seriously. So they're not worried. The other ones, it's interesting, are very excited about us because they want Google's workloads on their machines. So if we're portable, they're being, they're like, come on over, yeah, come on, you know, we'll we'll, we'll show you how to how to make it work on our on our system, and we'll help you out there, um, because they think the model is good too. So th so that's just what we've encountered, and um, yeah, I I'm I, I'm looking forward to the day when they all come after us, but and so far so good. Um, 
Other questions on this? Yes, please. Are you guys here? Like, wait for the mic. I'm sorry. In non-technical terms, you guys are essentially like a backdoor out of Google? Backdoor out of Google. And it's just like an insurance policy. Just think of it as an insurance policy. At any time, you can get out of Google if you want to. If you love it, stay there. In the future, something happens in the future, it's future-proofing your apps. It's just that. Non-technical. You're a backdoor to Google. Right. Thank you. OK. Any others on the AppScale stuff? OK. So I thought I'd give you some observations that I've had so far. And like I've said, it's only, I've only been doing this since October. Um, but uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that graduate school and actually being an academic, even it's, uh, though it seems like an oxymoron, really does prepare you for an entrepreneurial experience. It, it forces, I mean, a academia, it seems all nice and you get your summers off and all that, but um, it's really cutthroat, especially in computer science. Because look who we're competing against. We're competing against, what, 100, you know, 500 developers at Google? I'm competing against 500 developers at Google. That's crazy. Right? There's so many people out there that are doing cool things, and to stay on the cutting edge is insane, extremely competitive. All right? So you need, to be, be, you need to be able to be competitive. You've got to be able to want to compete. You've got to be able to like competing. Next thing is discipline. Um, it makes you focus. Academia makes you focus. Rejection. You get rejected all the time. I was just talking to a grad student I was walking in here who's, who's been reject rejected like a dozen times in the last two months. It seems completely impossible, but you do. Because science is hard. What you do is you invent something, and you find out it's already been invented. And you're like, oh, crap, that was two years of my life. Right? It's really hard. You've got to stay on top of it. You get rejected all the time for political reasons, even. I mean, there's a lot of politics. It's a small little community. Right? We're all competing for a very small number of resources. It helps you with analytic, analytic thinking and logical argument. I have to explain to a bunch of uh, undergraduates, a lot like you, who have their you know, cell phones and computers and doing all their cool stuff back there. And I have to be up here and trying to get them to be engaged, trying to get them to learn, trying to get you to be excited. Right? That's really hard. But once you achieve it, then, then going out and talking to customers is similar. The other thing I think is really similar is going out and asking for money. Especially in, in any kind of engineering field, you got to pay for your grad students. I have to get money for all my grad students, all their tuition and all of their stipend, even though we don't pay them that much, and then double that for the overhead that the university takes. All universities do this. It's how they stay afloat. It's fine, but that means you're always going out for money which means you've got to have a good game, you've got to be able to sell something, you've got to be able to get people excited about something, um, and you get rejected a lot. Very few resources. That money comes from the NSF. They're constantly messing around in, in Congress in, in Washington, D.C. You know, I thought before I, I became an academic, I'd never really paid attention to that. I pay attention to it all the time because it affects me. There's a grant I have that might not get the last, I've already won it, and I might not get the last piece of it because of what Congress is doing today. So it's just, it's just crazy, and um, you have to constantly adapt and be, uh, uh, have be thick-skinned, and that's really good for an entrepreneur that I've found so far. The things I didn't know, that I don't know how to do still, that I'm only learning as I go, is the business side of things. You really need to partner with someone who you can trust, who has the business chops, who can teach you and help you along the way. Um, so that's a really big one. The other one is I, I, don't, I don't ever interact with customers, right? I build software that does cool things. I don't make it pretty. <laughs> and I don't make it easy to use because that's not science, right? None of that's new. None of that's innovative. Sure, it'd be nice if I could do that, but I'm not being paid for that. My grants are for to do science, to do research, to make innovation happen, right? A nice UI is not innovation. Right? In business it is. It's everything in some cases. You could have a crappy little system on the back end, but you have a really cool GUI, you could win. I mean, it's possible. So that was something I didn't realize and I think is very cool and I've learned and we're constantly improving our UI now. Um, it's not about the technology. It's about the team. It's about the story you can tell. It's about finding the pain points and about adapting. Um, the other thing I didn't know really was, um, that especially as a leader, as a founder, or as a, um, some sort of upper management, probably, but really all new startup companies, um, 
you really have to have a public persona. You have to be public facing. I am now a business person. I have to tweet. I didn't tweet a whole lot before I started this job. And um, actually, it's uh, m um, uh, Mike's student that works for us who has taught me. She's 21 years old. I'm, I'm old enough to be her grandmother. And she's telling me every, you know, how to tweet. And, and it's wonderful. And I love it. You got to be open to that. Things change, and you got to keep up with it. Um, market validation, product and customer discovery. A lot of times we get full of ourselves and we think, oh no, we got the coolest thing since sliced bread. It's going to be, you know, people are going to pay me for this and I'm just going to go out and ask for a bunch of money. Uh, no, that's not how it works. You really got to go and talk to customers. You really have to have evidence um, that it's going to work. And you do not know, I guarantee it, you do not know what you are actually going to. Um, do <laughs> as an entrepreneur. You start out with an idea, but it turns out to be something completely different. And everybody says this to me. Everyone said this to me. I'm like, yeah, ha, ha, yeah. You know, I've been around a while. I, 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 yeah, whatever. But totally the truth. And I had to find it out for myself. And so you will too. And it's really, really key. The customers will tell you. The customers will tell you if you have something. Don't believe anybody else except for the people who want to pay you for what your idea is. Nobody else. Um, you need a strong professional network, start now. All these people in the classroom, you should know, you should have in your network, you should have some sort of record, link into them, use LinkedIn to, to, to connect with them. You never know when you cross a person's path again. And it's so weird when you do. You know, I, I guarantee that someday I'm going to be asking for a job from one of my students that I have graduated. Um, I just know that day is coming, but I cross paths with people all the time who can help me who can educate me, who I can help, um, and it's all by building this network. I do not believe that you can succeed if you are isolated, if you have no professional network, if you do not reach out to people, even random people sitting next to you. Do it. I guarantee it will pay off. You know, all of you should link into me, right? Um, tell me who you are. Tell me you're in this class. You know, someday we will cross paths. You'll say, you know, you came in and you just talked at us for two hours, but I need a job. Or, I have this great job, you talked for five hours, you need to come and, and be my spokesmodel. <laughs> all right, uh, really important. Um, other observations. It consumes all of your time. Do not be, do not make, you know, jokes and do not think that, I, that any of this is, um, is silly. This is, this is really serious. You have to be all in. And when I say all in, I don't mean just you. I mean the people that you care about in your life. They have to be all in because you cannot leave them behind. You will not survive without a good foundation of people who care for you. Um, if you go off and do this crazy thing and disappear and you know, write off your family or write off your, your, your partners or just write off your friends, you'll wake up one day and you'll be alone and you'll have no job, right? Your company will go under. You really need to have those people in your life. They have to be there to support you. You've got to be honest with them. This is going to kill me. I'm going to not be around much. But know that I just need your support, and I need you to be there for me. Get them to buy in. You'll be, have much more potential for success. Uh, I'm sure you learn about it in this class, but I didn't really understand this when I started. Uh, Venture-backed business is a completely different thing than a uh, lifestyle business or to bootstrap it yourself. Um, their expectations are enormous. Uh, it, it, there, we're talking numbers that I don't even know how many zeros are off the end of that. Um, uh, and, and what the expectations are is that in a very short amount of time, you're going to be um, Sergey Brin. That's the guy at Google, right? They expect this. They put pressure on you for this. You need to be able to have, be thick-skinned about this, believe in what you got, and go and try. Um, your team is everything, even more than your technology. Your technology will fail. You will change, you will pivot, you will find new ideas. But if you have a great team, a great handful of people around you to do this with, you can win. Um, uh, I'd even go so far as to say, um, even if you, there's some like little dislike, so you think about doing this company with, it, with, your, with, your, with your buddy. And you really like the buddy, you get along most of the time. You don't hang out with him a ton, but and there's a few things that annoy you about him. When you go into a company together, those little things that annoy you about him will just explode into these huge things that drive you crazy. Right? Find the right people. Find the right people that you know you can go into the trenches with and fight this war, because it's a war. It's not very long, but it's a war. 
Um, hype can be deadly. Don't get all full of yourselves. It's so easy. People come to you and they're like, oh my God, you have the greatest thing ever. And you're like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And everyone's going to give me a million dollars and I'm going to, um, you know, be the next Sergey Brin and all that. Um, and then all of a sudden you look around and no one's there. Right? It happens all the time. We, we do, it's just human nature. We get all excited, but you get a little full of ourselves. Don't let that happen. And don't be, so, and have some thick skin about the negative stuff too. There's a lot of crap out there, and there'll be crap that's aimed at you if you start to do something that people find interesting. Good stuff and bad stuff. Let it roll off. Keep your eye on the ball. Focus on what the end goal is. The end goal is getting customers and getting revenues and making a difference in people's lives, alleviating the pain that your customers have. Keep your eye on the ball. Your integrity will be challenged, I guarantee it. You do one of these things, you will be asked to lie, you will be asked to you know, hurt your little sister. There are bad things that you will be asked to do and you need to know now, before you even step out of this room, what line you will not cross. What line you will not cross. Maybe you'll do these little funky things. Maybe you'll just leave a, a, few, a little bit of information. Once in a while, you just get irritated and you'll shoot off a tweet that's really bad. Okay, all right, we're all, we all are human. We all make mistakes, but find your line and never cross it. Never cross it, even if your business will fail because of it. Don't cross that line. Don't hurt your people. Don't hurt the people you care about. Do not lie. You know, be above board. If you have the higher ground, if you have the moral high ground, you will, you will win. You will find a way. may not seem it like it in the moment, but don't cross that line. And then there's this sort of a lighter note. There are certain things that will happen in your company, and you're like, this should be, like, not even discussed. And it becomes this mountain of issue. And ours was the website. I thought, come on, the website is awful. It's always awful. It changes all the time. We're not, this is not our core competency. You know, we can't do a website. We can do a basic one, sure. Oh my God, we fought about that. We got mad at each other for that. Everyone had a say. I don't even know what the, the special color blue is, but it's really important. Um, don't get into, don't let that happen. It happens, but know that these things are silly. Once they're passed, you're like, oh yeah, we're friends again, you know. Um, I'm sorry I put the, you know, app scale under the A and, you know, it's just ridiculous. But things happen like that. It's because you're under pressure and, you know, you're, you're stressed and you're insecure and there's no promise for tomorrow. There's hope, but there's no promise. And that brings out insecurities in people that you have, you haven't seen, even people you think you know well. It's really interesting, and you got to be ready for it, and you will survive it. Then the last thing I wanted to do is leave you some advice on work-life balance. My, I tell my husband, because I do give talks about work-life balance all the time, and my husband says to me, um, you, are such a, you, are su you, you, you are such a phony. You have no work-life balance, and you're going and talking to these people about work-life balance, and um, you know, he always calls me out on it. So. Um, I, I preface this with saying I do not have work-life balance. Um, <laughs> so I'm being honest. Uh, but I want to argue, and I hope this for all of you, is that your work becomes your life. That you love what you do so much that you can't wait to get up in the morning and go work on it and go solve more problems or go help more people. You can't wait. You, you want to you work till 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, midnight, 2 a.m that it's so compelling. I wish this for all of you, because if you, if you have it, you are so lucky. All right, if that's your life, it's gonna be hard for you to find balance, because that is balance. You wanna work all the time. It's really fun, it's really great. You love the people you're doing it with. Um, but I want to point out that your work-life balance is not the only thing that, it, all right, so, so your little teeter-totter is not the only little teeter-totter that's involved. It's the teeter-totter, which is the work-life balance of all the people that you have in your life. The people you work with, your family, your parents, your friends, they all have work-life balances, that, and, and, and they expect some, something from you. They expect you to be their friend. They expect to be able to call you when they're moving so that you can come and hurt your back and get some free pizza and beer later. Um, they expect to be able to um, cry on your shoulder when you need it when they need it, and you might be under some tremendous deadline. I encourage you to think about that, to, to think about being able to 
allocate some time for these people because like I said, you gotta be all in, but you can wake up one day and have nothing and have nothing, nobody around you. And that even if you have a great company, you will be miserable. You gotta, be, you gotta keep those people in your life. Um, and so that's really the challenge is how do I eke off enough time for these people that I care about? I have to call my mom, you know, uh, well, once a week. And, you know, that means I have to and so get up a little earlier, right? Sleep a little less. Make time for these people. Um, notice that demands come in waves. If you're a workaholic, um, you have to take advantage of when that wave is kind of lulling, right? Because you cannot sustain an insane pace. You cannot. I know you think you can, you're young, uh, you will learn. Uh, if you burn yourself out, you can't do anything. It's really like you wake up one day, you hit a wall, and even though you wanna do work, you're so distracted, you can't think, you can't focus, you can't do anything. You're completely useless. Don't get there, right? Know that it will be okay if you take care of yourself, if you sleep, if you exercise, if you say no to things, right? That is the way, be very disciplined in your time management. That will help you with your work-life balance and not going insane. Um, the other big one, I, and I argue this all the time, I think we get out of balance because we're all just insecure. We're all thinking, I'm an imposter, I'm an idiot, everyone around me is smarter than me, um, I'm really lazy, I don't wanna work, I just want to lay around, um, but you know, all my friends are ahead of me. We all have little insecurities and they manifest in ways that make us do stupid things, like uh, overwork or do you try to compete or do bad things and, and uh, be mean to s people because you know, you're feeling bad about yourself. All that leads to stress, which leads to this, this imbalance, I, I think. So really understand what your insecurities are, just talk about them, right? I know what mine are. I feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like everything I've done, it, it, you know, every one of you can do. I feel like everything I've done is such a menial, um, um, you know, inadequate accomplishment, right? And then my sister comes over and slaps me, and then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I did do a PhD. I, I didn't make it this far, but it's really hard for me to admit that, right? Telling you is extremely hard, right? Talk to your friends about it. It will help you. You'll be a better person. Uh, take care of your body. Uh, eat well, don't eat some crap, um, you, you know, you're so tired, you haven't gone to the market for 15 days, so the stuff in the refrigerator is really looking in colors that really shouldn't be something you put in your body. Um, you don't have time to go to the market, uh, make time. Get, get, be healthy. If you, if, you're, if you start to eat crap or not eat well, um, your brain is effective, you will not be as productive. Uh, exercise. I know you don't want to do it. Sometimes you just want to sit there and focus, especially if you, if you have more of a sedentary job, get out and do it. You will be more productive. I find I am much better when I'm able to get out and do the exercise, get the exercise I need. I am so much more productive, even though I take, you know, three, four, five hours a week off just to exercise. I get more done with five hours of exercise off than I do if I just work through those five hours. I get more done. You can too. And last, uh, Work on your relationships. You gotta put effort into them. Um, they will save you, they will uh, help you on your bad days. Um, and, and this is all obvious, but ask for help when you need it, but also go give help. When you're feeling lousy and you're under stress and you think you're gonna fail and everything sucks, go and help someone who's you know, d d disadvantaged compared to you. You know, you have a tremendous life, even though it may not be perfect. Right, there are so many people who are, have some, are so much more disadvantaged. Go help them just a little bit. Even just give them a little money or go help them explain you know, why, they're, why it's, it's, it's cool that they exist. Right? It'll make you feel so good. And it helps you get your mind back settled and then you can focus on your work and, um, and, and go from there. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time.